Okay, welcome to Summer School 2020. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor John Aitchison. His career has been dedicated to South African education. He's Professor Emeritus at the University of KZN, where he was previously head of the School of Education, Training De and Development, and then of the School of Adult and Higher Education. He served on the Ministerial Committee on Literacy in 2006 and 7, and on the Ministerial Committee on the Review of the Funding Frameworks of TVET and CET Colleges. He currently works for the Primary Teacher Education Development Project, and is that where some of the work is taking place at WITS, or is that a different project? It's all over the place. It's all, all over the place. <laughs> so we're very lucky to have him. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, and welcome to all of you. Um, I have a passion for reading, and I assume that passion is shared by all of you. We have a problem, and lots of people are thinking about this reading problem, which perhaps one should, as I've titled it, call a cognitive catastrophe. I was thinking that we often think of reading, literacy, writing in terms of school results, but perhaps the, the broader thing is what damage is being done to our whole perceptions, our awareness of the world through not being able to effectively read and write. Hence, when the report was published a couple of years ago, where it was announced that 78% of grade four learners in South Africa couldn't read for meaning in their home language, let alone in, you know, often English, um, there was a problem. And in fact, it's a profound judgment on our education system. So the four lectures I've put together is to look at the reasons for this reading catastrophe, what are its consequences, and something about the debates about how does one read and write, how does one learn to do that, and the factors that are influencing addressing the problem, inhibiting changes to the situation, and of course there are a number of very positive initiatives that are dealing with the problem. So there's some hope. So, I've posed it there in a very bold way. Is it a case of cognitive genocide? In, in a sense, an attack on the thinking processes of a whole lot of people. Now, I've put together four propositions. Firstly, that failing to read is really disabling if you are going to function effectively in a modern society. Incidentally, I am going to circulate these slides uh, to everybody because we've got your email lists after the course, so you don't need to take detailed notes, but I, I will circulate these slides. So, if we're going to use our brains effectively in a modern society, with a growing knowledge economy, we see all this hype about, you know, the fourth fourth industrial revolution, that is a problem. Secondly, we've got generations now who have been cognitively stunted because of a massive failure in the education system. If our schools, our education system was functioning effectively, as should be fit a middle-income country. South Africa is a middle-income country. I know that a lot of the wealth is high up and very little at the bottom, but it's a middle-income country. 
our gross domestic product would probably be 550 billion rand higher than it is at the present. That incidentally would have upset the Guptas looting. We could have made it up if we read properly. And in fact, it can be argued that illiteracy, in its full sense, is the largest barrier to South African growth and development. Now, how do we know there is a real problem? The Southern and Eastern African Consortium for Monitoring Educational Quality, SACMEC, did studies. It's, it, it, it's consortium of, of, of the East, Eastern African countries and, and the SADC region. In 2007, South Africa came out worse than Kenya, Tanzania, Swaziland, Botswana, and Zimbabwe. And I asked why. Those are poorer countries than us. Teachers did do better than the children, but when they compared the teacher scores on the same tests that they'd given to the children in 2007, the teacher scores had dropped by 11% in that period. One has to ask what is going on. There was some improvement in learner scores in 2013, and there are various hypotheses that could explain that. Now, the real, the real devastating judgment comes from an international study, the so-called Progress in International Reading Literacy Study. It's an international study conducted all over the world. And if you look at the top um, there, that red indicates grade four, you can't read. You cannot read for meaning in your home language. And then you got a, a low basement, and then the very few who meet good standards. If you then compare it to the international scores, you'll find that those who can't read are a very small minority, 4% in schools. The majority can certainly do possibly, and at least half have really reached a high benchmark or an advanced benchmark. So that is a devastating graph. 78% of children in South African schools cannot read for meaning. Now you may ask, what does that actually mean? Because reading for meaning could mean anything. Well, and, and just incidentally, just to show, you won't probably be able to see there, but uh, right at the top, who did scored highest, Russian Federation, the Russians know how to read because they took the literacy very seriously after the Bolshevik Revolution, and they made their society truly literate. And they... Oh, is it banging against something? Yeah, probably... Let's try and get this... I'm going to put it... I hope that's better. So Russia up there at the top, down at the bottom, unfortunately, is South Africa. That's of about 59 countries. Look, a lot of these are, are, are reasonably, you know, well-endowed countries. There are relatively few poor countries, but you'll see um, Kuwait, um, Iran, etc. cetera. Um, Egypt, just above us, and there is South Africa at the bottom. So, yeah, we have a, a problem. Now, what does it mean? I don't know whether you can read that text, but that is a simple little text. This is, this is a sample one. It's not the actual test, but it's an equivalent one they use for you know, training 
people on how to use this test. There's Charlotte, who was different from all the other sheep. And you read through that little text, and then you are asked to answer some questions. Who is Jack? Now, if you read that little test, we can test you all whether you can pass the pearls uh, reading for meaning. Anybody? Who? What is Jack? Woof, woof. <laughs> Jack is a dog. So that you answer, you write Jack is a dog, and you are beginning to read for meaning. Uh, what did Jack try to, to do with Charlotte? Well, tried to control, control her. So you can see the level of reading. This is grade four. A child should be able to read that text in their mother tongue. And so this, this, these tests were given, they were very carefully um, versioned in all the South African languages. Um, they were back translated to ensure that the, the, the text was, was correct, and so it went. And there it, it carries on, it becomes a little bit more, give two ways, the child was different from the other sheep, and you read the text, and they give you, a, where was Charlotte standing in the picture on the opposite page, so you can read a picture, uh, get meaning from a picture, and so forth. So you get a sense of the level at which reading was being tested. And I, I think you'd agree with me, if a child cannot read a simple text like that in grade four, there is a problem. And 78% could not. But there was, the mic was bouncing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah, we do have something of a problem. Now, in 2010, the Department of Basic Education developed a set of workbooks uh, for grades one to six and also reception year for all schools in all languages, mother tongue languages. They also developed maths um, workbooks. And I think they were a very great initiative. This is a text from the grade three workbook. And one can certainly see a simple text. You could probably read that. I would think you should be able to read that if you've been taught how to read properly and learned how to answer questions about it. But this was all going on. These books were in every school. They were delivered to every school. They were in every classroom, and in theory, every child had a copy of one of these workbooks. And one has to then ask the question, did no one notice that 78% of the children could not read this test, text? What is going on in the school system? So what is the problem? Is it the learners? Is it the environment? Is it the teachers? Or is it the people who train the teachers? What about the parents? That's in the environment. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Parents also would be a very important factor. Okay, let, let's, let's look at those, those factors. Yeah. Mm. That's a good point. Um, that, that, that's the whole education system throughput pressure. What do you do with it? Yeah. 
Okay, the learners. Clearly, there's a problem with poverty. There's an issue of location, whether you're in a town or a rural area. There's the speech environment. Basically, are the parents talking to their children and reading to them? And there's the book environment. I'm going to look at each of those in turn. Poverty. 27% of children in South Africa under five are physically stunted. It's an empirical finding from the South African Demographic and Health Survey 2016. So a quarter of South African children are malnourished. That is a terrible indictment on South Africa. And of course, physical stunting also affects your brain. Only 23% of children aged 6 to 23 have a minimum acceptable diet. 8.5% of children have never attended school. Now, one of the realities of human existence is that some people are either physically or mentally handicapped or mentally very weak. On average, in any society, rich or poor, about 5% of people are they're not, not really going to succeed with any schooling. So one's got to account for that. Incidentally, it's one of the reasons why whenever you read that some country has 99% literacy, you know it's a lie. It's impossible. <laughs> it's literally impossible. Um, so 8.5% never attended school is perhaps not as bad as it sounds because there are so few facilities for seriously handicapped or mentally handicapped children in South Africa. And of course only 27.5% complete secondary school. Location, as we all know, as the estate agents tell us, location is important. In South Africa, you will see that if you live in a city or large town, the number who fail to learn to read is relatively low. I mean, it's still high, appallingly high, but it's not as bad as if you are in a remote rural area. So clearly, facilities in rural areas, small settlements, small villages, and even in urban townships are it pays to get into the central city in terms of your child's education. Maybe that common sense, but that is a reality, and it does say we are failing to provide support for people in rural areas and in urban settlements. The speech environment. Um, children learn their vocabulary, they learn their language through interaction with their parents, caregivers. And again, it's a reality that the gap between some children entering grade one, um, maybe something, something like two to four hundred percent in the number of words that they know some children know more words than others. And in a school environment, that is really important. The more words you know, the better you do. The more words you know, you can, when you are starting to read, you can recognize those words. Now, there's a whole lot of stuff in the sociology of education. Many of you have heard of Basil Bernstein, who developed this um, formulation that, that there were two kinds of linguistic codes. A restricted code, which is the sort of thing we, we use at home. Relatively few words. It assumes everybody knows what you're talking about, and you pot it, pad it with all sorts of um, things like, yeah, do you know? Don't you? You know, all those sort of paddings we add in our everyday speech. And in fact, most adults in the ordinary communication only use about 600 to 1,000 words. We don't use an elaborate vocabulary. Then there was the 
what he called the elaborated code, which was used extensively by middle class people, including middle class people interacting with their children. It's much more formal. It, it's more decontextualized. So when you use this, the, the assumption is that where you don't know the additional information, which in your home environment with the restricted code, you assume everybody knows, where, where you don't know what's going on, the person speaking will elaborate and tell you in detail. It's the kind of thing we expect children to do in a classroom situation. What is that animal in that picture, Timber? It's a giraffe. What do giraffe do? They've got long necks and they eat leaves at the top. It's, it's that kind of elaboration which middle class parents tend to start talking to their children. So that when they get into school, and that is the way the discourse happens, they are familiar with it. There's a similar kind of um, formulation which talks about basic interpersonal communication skills, BICS, and CALP, Cognitively Academic Language Proficiency, where that, that kind of says again what, what Bernstein was saying. Now, there's a lot of debate about restricted and elaborated code, but one can see that the way parents talk to their children and how elaborate they are in their interaction will prepare a child for schooling and for reading. And then we move on to the book environment. And this also relates to parents. 47% of children aged 0 to 4 years never read a book or drew with a parent. It's nearly half the children in South Africa never had a parent reading to them or drawing something. 35% of children never even had a story told to them by their parents. That was the General Household Survey of 2018. 65% of parents never read to their children. Only 5 to 15% of parents read regularly to their children. And of course, only 18% of parents encourage their children to read. That was a national survey conducted in two years, 2007 and 2016. Again, one can see why we have a problem. Books in the home. There's a lot of international research on this. Um, there was a big international study that found simply Having books in the home available for the children to look at and, of course, once they learn how to read, to read, had an enormous impact, even if the parents themselves were illiterate or poorly literate. Being raised in a home with 500 books and barely literate parents has the same effect as having university-educated parents. And they've, they've looked at the advantage. It, it gives you a 3.2 year advantage in education in the USA if there are lots of books in the home. And in China, it gives you a 6.6% advantage. That, that's an amazing finding. The children just having access to books in the home makes a huge difference. So getting some books into homes is an expensive way to help children succeed. Now, when we come to South Africa, the news is generally rather sad. Very few people read in their home language. That itself is devastating. Most people read in English. This was the similar to that book survey of 2016. Reading books, print level, books, newspapers, magazines, 
dropped between 2006 and 2016. So we, as a nation, are getting worse as readers. It dropped for newspapers by 14%, for magazines by 11%, and for books by 11%. Now, one may argue that some of this is being taken up positively by television and by smartphones. You know, how much of your day do you spend looking at Facebook or the internet? But certainly print, we're going down. Only 14% of the South African population are committed book readers. And fewer people are getting books from a library. There was a 50% drop in library use since 2006. That day is, comes to a total of something like 1.7 million less people were going to the library and taking out books. Fewer people are buying books. So, if I may make an advert, buy a book today. Then we come to the teachers. So, the environment is tough. But what about the teachers? The weakest entrance into the university system go into education. And it so happens, nursing. The popular careers are medical, doctor, want to become a doctor, want to become a lawyer, Maybe if you can count an accountant, those are the high prestige things. And if you don't get anywhere near that because you've got too few points, you go into education. So your weaker students are becoming teachers. Of course, there are honorable exceptions, but there's a very real problem in the intake of teachers into the South African system. One also has to remember that something like 70,000 people being trained as teachers do so through UNISA, which has, you know, you, you, you go to UNISA, you know, with all due respect to UNISA, largely because you cannot get into a nice face-to-face -face residential contact university. Teachers themselves, uh, we know that teachers aren't working effectively. Um, the absenteeism of teachers, something like in 43% of schools, teach, some teachers are always absent. Teachers arrive late in 53% of schools. The average South African teacher, according to Linda Chisholm, who did research in 2005, only spends 3.4 hours a day actually teaching. Yet the school day is longer than that. Um, Nick Taylor in 2008 found that teachers were achieving poor literacy scores on tests at the level they were teaching. It goes back to that SACMEC thing where they have done, but you know, although they were better than the learners, they weren't that much better. I've been involved in a teacher development program for the last three and a half years, and we have been to most South African universities. We've interviewed teacher educators, and we've interviewed students. And speaking to many of the educators, teaching the courses, the modules that seem to be in some way connected to training literacy teachers, a lot of them actually did not seem familiar with common phrases and terms essential to the serious study of the teaching of reading. Particularly at the foundation and intermediate phases. And then we come to the question of the educators of the teachers. 
do universities know how to teach literacy, reading and writing? And that is an interesting question. And I will be looking at that in a subsequent lecture. Do they know the best methods to teach reading and writing, the methods, the techniques? Are they up to date on modern research on the teaching of reading and writing? And then more broadly looking at the management of universities, the academic management, do universities consider the knowledge and skills of teaching reading to be an important part of the teacher education curriculum? I would argue that the answer to those three points is, on the whole, no. But most universities don't know how to teach literacy teachers. They are unfamiliar with the best methods and techniques to teach reading and writing. And reading and writing form, if at all, a very small component of the whole teacher education curriculum. Now, which is normally a four-year Bachelor of Education degree, so there's ample time, um, although many teachers, particularly high school teachers, do a postgraduate certificate in education, and that is a one-year program. Don't exist anymore. They were all closed down in 2000. I will deal with that problem later. So what is the problem? Going back to Pearls. Pearls shows us that 78% of children cannot read. And then, you know, extrapolating that, one cannot expect libraries to be used if only 22% of the population can read. or buy newspapers, or magazines. So there's your, your problem. OK, 22% can read, which is fantastic. Um, and that goes to your 27% who get into high school, and the elite who manage to come out with a senior certificate, so-called matric, and want to get into a university, which is a very logical progression route because going to university is really excellent for your personal career. Because South Africa has the best cash value of any country in the world of getting a degree. By cash value, I mean the increase in your income as a result of being a university graduate is the highest in South Africa of any country in the world. They can understand why everybody wants to get into university. <laughs> well, that, that, the laughter answers your question. <laughs> so that's your 22%. And then you have your 27% stunted. And that cannot be addressed by improving reading and teaching methods and techniques. That is a problem of development and inequality in the country. And that is a socio-economic political problem. Because it can be addressed. And South Africa has certainly tried to address in certain ways, like the child support grant. But uh, again, I, I think one of the things we're going to have to go for is a basic income grant um, to start addressing the huge poverty, uh, which leads, of course, to children not having enough food um, at all. Then, 
51% were not taught to read. That is an instructional failure. That is a school failure. And so that is where attempts to address it have to be placed. It's the, the, there's a complicated answer to that. Um, it's partly, a, well, an English-speaking world issue. It's not really a problem in other language countries, but it, uh, I will address particularly that problem later. So what can we do? Change the children? We can't change the children. We've got them. There's not much we can do at a macro level about getting parents to talk to their children. This is a whole massive socio-economic political thing. We can't change their parents. They've got the parents they've got. Can we change the schools? Yes, we can. And we know we've got a pretty dysfunctional education system. Can we change the teachers? We can't do a great deal with the ones we've got. Um, you know, even with, um, you know, so-called mandatory teacher development programs, but one can try, and there are programs trying to improve the current teachers. Can we change the teacher educators? Yes, we can. We can improve what they are doing, and later on in this lecture series and in the fourth lecture, I'll look at some of the programs which are trying to change the teacher educators. Um, I've got a whole lot of references. That's the first presentation I'm giving, and that poses the problem. But over to you. Any questions or comments? Yes? Where does the Mandatory Education Act fit into this whole problem? Well, the Bantu Education Act of, um, in the early 50s basically removed education for black people away from um, provinces and church churches who often ran many schools. It became very much controlled by the central apartheid state and it restricted the curriculum in certain respects but as a functioning system, it was a low quality system. It wasn't as well funded. You see, that was a crucial thing. It was very poorly funded um, compared to what was going on for white people and to some extent for colored and, and Indian people. Um, it was largely a question of resources. It was a, it was a low quality system. But in terms of the actual primary education, it actually expanded a bit. And, as I said, it was inferior to what was going on in white schools, but it was still providing a minimal. Yeah, but it, I think its major impact was actually particularly at the higher level. It, it, it only later got into secondary education with any enthusiasm, largely after 1976, and uh, it was an inferior system. It obviously provided a deficit uh, particularly in terms of teacher training, etc., because all the teacher training institutions were largely taken over by the apartheid government. Hmm. Why do we have called the Zimbabwean system? Well, the Zimbabwean system we know was a better education system. It was very closely modelled on the English system, with a very, uh, um, particularly at, at your high school level. Um, quite intense study of, of a more restricted, so you would, in a sense, major in, in a, a few subjects, rather unlike the South African system where you have seven or so major subjects. Um, it, they were well-trained teachers. Um, it was a better system, we know that. Mm. It still is, although it, it, it's having severe problems because of um, finance, it, it was a better system. It was a better managed system. And Mugabe himself, his government took education very, very seriously um, as a priority, unlike in South Africa in 1994 when 
because of various other uh, ideological factors, education was not taken seriously. I don't think it's been done deliberately. I think it's um, a kind of benign neglect. And the resources, the way they've been directed, have, as always, been directed to the elite coming out of the top of the school system. Um, high school education was taken more seriously, and of course, university education. And it's a question of priorities. Who do you serve, the poor or the elite? And South Africa has made a decision to serve the elite black and white, and that has consequences. So there was a kind of benign neglect of poor people and the schools they're in. It used to be a high status. Um, you know, in the early apartheid period, teachers were highly respected because remember, the, the, there were very few professional status jobs that black people could aspire to. You could become a doctor that was an incredibly prestigious, and you went to the medical school at the University of Natal. You could become a lawyer partly because of the way articles were done. So those were the two really high press. And you could become a teacher or a nurse. So those were the four professions. All the other professions were basically out of reach of black people, certainly in, in the business or the uh, industrial world. So it was. But it, 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 in common with, I think, most Western countries, the status of teaching has gone down. It's been seen as something that simply reproduces the system. We get people to run it. Uh, the real emphasis is on the economy and the prestigious professions dealing with money and law. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a sad fact of life. Teaching is no longer, and, and of course people know it's hard work and it's tough out there. Who wants to become a teacher in a rural school miles out? There's no housing. You have to travel there uh, if you're highly qualified. At the same time, we've, we've upped the qualifications of teachers so you don't get poorly paid teachers who are happy to live in a rural area. language and yet we know from a language perspective if you grow as 
take a last question because I've been told I've got to close up for the next lecture. Veronica. I was wondering uh, what evidence there is in relation to the privileging of the oral as opposed to literacy um, that has a historical precedent and whether that continues to follow through in how we conceptualize education. Um, for example, the students that I teach are very often more oral than literate, um, extremely good at discussion, mm. Mm. Um, can all the concepts in the head but can't write it down, mm. and definitely can't read it. And that, the privileging of orality, mm. has a yeah. um, I don't know whether it's actually a privileging. I, I think it's a question of schooling hasn't actually as a reading culture hasn't taken. Because in many of our schools, there's very little actual reading and writing. It is predominantly oral. And so that, that continues. Um, so one understands how it then carries forward. Um, but it's a complex, you know, it, it is a complex thing. I mean, Um, I don't think it's a West. Uh, I mean, all cultures historically have had literate elites, going back to the Egyptians. Um, and I, I, I don't think the, there are very few exceptions to that. All major cultures, you know, civilizations have had literate elites. Um, I don't think it's particularly Western, the same in China has a very high stress on, on, on the literate. And, and of course in China you serious struggle because it take you seven years to learn how to read. Uh, <laughs> I must close. See you tomorrow morning. Yes. Are you going to be addressing the issue of the protection of teachers against being held accountable for the quality of education? I may allude to it. Because to me it's a pivotal It is a problem. Mm. Yeah.